So today, and I'm Ed Molesky, James West is not going to be with us today, so I'm sitting here with the task of being the host. I have with me my dear friend, Stephen Meisner. Stephen's a, a, a vet of Bay Street, has been a vet for a number of years, former fund manager with various uh, insurance companies. Very, very smart guy. We're going to have a lot to talk about today. Steve, nice to see you, my friend. Nice to see you, Ed, too. Yeah, here we are. You've been in Bay Street 30 plus years. I've been here 30 plus years. We should be able to tell the audience a thing or two, right? That's the thing about the stock market is uh, it always take you back to remedial class yeah, once in yeah, a while. Yeah, for sure. It's always little summer school. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, We've seen a lot, haven't Pe we? People say uh, the easy money's been made, but I'll never remember it being quite so easy. I know. Jesus. <laughs> but I mean, uh, the there are trends to spot, and, sure, and we sure. certainly learn them over time. I mean, look, I mean, look, at, look at this marijuana bubble. Well, I call it a bubble, but maybe it isn't a bubble. It's uh, going live here in another week. Mm -hmm. Look at the money that Tilray just raised four hundred and fifty million bucks, just yeah. like like that. Yeah, the Tilray deal. Obviously, Tilray has been a spectacular success. The first uh, yeah. first listed um, cannabis stock on on the Nasdaq. Uh, yeah. they, they they came out with a four hundred million dollar uh, convertible deal last week. Uh, the demand was certainly uh, uh, in excess of that. They upsized it to uh, yeah. four hundred and fifty. And uh, when you analyze the numbers, the coupon was very reasonable. They put a 5% coupon on that it. It seems low. It was low, uh, especially when, uh, especially when it, was, it was just uh, higher than, uh, slightly higher than what uh, yeah. Canopy Rivers put on a private deal back in June. Typically, high growth companies can come out with 2 yeah. and 3% uh, coupons. And the premium at 15% was low as well. So, so the conversion on the, uh, this is a convertible deal. Yes. And they control the conversion. Uh, well, the, the buyers have privileges after a certain time. Sure. And so, so the, if you look at it, I mean, they're willing to sell this to the public. Yes. They're saying, hey, we'll take all the money we can get, basically, mm -hmm. at, at these prices. Probably, yeah, I mean, the, I, mean maybe I, I think that's an that, well, the conversion price uh, was equivalent to I think in the $167 range. That the stock was in the 140s at the time. That would constitute about you know the 15% premium, right? Which is low. Typically, convertibles come out with about a 25% premium. So 15% sure. look conservative. You know, we won't know exactly, but my guess is that they were approached both by the underwriters, which is typical, but also maybe a couple of right. whether they were strategic or just uh, institutional players or hedge funds that wanted the convertible note versus straight stock. They wanted some income, and that might have been an institutional play. Some institutions can only buy securities that have some kind of dividend or income attached, so it, it could be brand new buyers. Yeah. And, and, uh, Certainly, Tilray has a has a war chest. I mean, they they close this deal. They got tons of cash. Yeah. They got a, a market cap. The stock was twenty five dollars two three months ago, right? Mm -hmm. When they when they went public. Yeah, right in the end. Of, every end week of August, a, If yeah. you look at the, the candles, and 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 I'm a technical guy. Every week since the first week's been green. Mm -hmm. And and now we've we've rolled over a bit. They've raised a bunch of money. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, obviously the first one out, uh, and 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 they they timed it beautifully to to catch sure. a, a hot hot spike in the market yeah. in, in the marijuana space in general. But when it when it spiked that day to three hundred dollars, even for a nanosecond, yeah. it was quite amazing. And I think it was probably again I don't know, but I think it was probably program buying where computers sure. were buying it without regard for price, and that created that incredible gap, which is now backfilled. It's backfilled and rolling over. But to have the stock sitting at the one, you know, high 120s right now is also impressive because typically on a convertible deal, you're going to get sure. some hedgers in the deal where they want to short the stock while they're long the bond and they can arbitrage a spread. So, uh, but the liquidity's there, so yeah. it's likely that that shorting, whatever may have happened yeah. to whatever amount, the 400 million was hedged out is probably done. So the stock's holding in quite yeah. well in that respect. So let, let's move on to uh, another big name in, in the news today, I guess is Aurora. Mm -hmm. Aurora has now said that they are going to 
list on the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, there's a lot of anticipation with that. I mean, the rumor was that was out, out there, right? That was rumor out there. was around, but today they formally filed and they issued against that that uh, they are making the formal application. Um, you know, they, again, they've indicated they think they can possibly get it done by the end of October, which is a very short timeline. Uh, it would seem that they probably, obviously, but, but this doesn't. I mean, look, like you're a, you're a hard money guy. You've been in. You, you've analyzed things to death. Is this a reason for, for people to buy stock? Maybe. Well, the, considering the stock was down at, uh, down at eight, eight and a quarter uh, three weeks ago, it's already over 13 now. So yeah. therefore, some of that's in there now. I mean, obviously a fairly warm, receptive cannabis I mean, their, uh, their market cap is somewhere between seven and 10, isn't it? Like, isn't that the, the, the market cap for Aurora? That I'd have to check. Yeah, I, I no, but it's, uh, it's, but, um, it's up there. Yeah, um, but I mean, there's a, there's a sentiment. Obviously there have been, I think that the $5 move that we've had uh, is, is in part because of this anticipated listing. Um, sure. But remember, Aurora is still off from its all-time high last January when many stocks have shot through that. Yeah, and James and I often have this discussion. He said the reason is because they've made this major acquisition, which was a dilutive, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, the stock price doesn't reflect it, but all of a sudden the company's twice as big. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that happens a lot, right? Like, you know, you say, well, the stock didn't move, and then the guy says, yeah, but I issued lots of paper. Mm -hmm. no, not good for the shareholder, but good yeah. for the company. But, but it's possible, too, that, they, that that uh, increase in market cap has, is in support of sure. this bigger listing. Sure. Because you don't list on the, on, the, you know, on the biggest stock exchange in the world unless you have a material market cap. So that's probably supportive of that, even sure. though yeah. it's been a flatline performer you know, versus some of the others uh, in the last several you know, months. We, we, when you and I, we've been around a lot of years. It's hard to buy a stock that you could have bought at eight or nine. And, and, and a month later, it's 13 or 14, you think, yeah. well, if I didn't buy it then, why would I buy it now? But, but listen. You can, I'm not going to make the analogy, uh, except that there is a, a, you know, an unrelated coincidence that it was in late August of one year ago, 13 months ago, when Canopy Growth was trading at eight, and it popped in early October, and we we're in early October, to twelve dollars and thirteen dollars when Constellations made the first deal and they they bought in at a premium. Right. And so the stock had this big multi-dollar sure, pop sure. on pretty profound and game-changing news in the sector. Yeah. But an interesting equivalency of the of the dollar value from eight to thirteen in both cases yeah. over the same five, six week timeline. Not the same story, yeah. not the same circumstance, just a coincidence. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and look, like I, I sit here and I mean, like I'm, I'm a pot, I hate to admit it, I'm a pot smoker, not that I hate to admit it, but at the end of the day, did I think that the marijuana sector was gonna take on this kind of enthusiasm and, and command this kind of market cap? Well, that's the problem, Ed, with us sometimes is we, and we put our analytical hats on, we, we look for uh, some of the traditional core valuation spectrum and, and parameters and, yeah. and they don't really exist in a new space like this. These stocks, like other emerging yeah. sectors, are based on on future growth yeah. and future possibilities because the fundamentals aren't immediately supportive. Yeah, we're right back to the highs we set about eight days ago on ACB. Around thir It hit 1350, it backed off. It's around 1320, 1305. Yeah. Where would you say it broke out, though, uh, in the most recent? Was the breakout well, around 12, you, you know, 12 and a half? I mean, you, you, know, you know what? It's, it's still had a big run. If we can get the chart up on ACB control room. There it is. So, so look, look, you got a, I got a pen here. I don't know if I can work this. But, but, but I don't like, look, look, what I don't like is I didn't Better, buy it here. You should tell the audience what the timeline is for this chart. Yeah, that, this is a, uh, this looks like a... Uh, well, it goes back to July. Yeah, See? okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to... So, sorry, so it, it's about it's a three-month three chart. It's, it's a three-month, three yeah. In fact, why don't we do this? I'll put up a six-month. I mean, unbelievably, in early, you know, around the, around the 12th of August, it was trading down, uh, down about five and a quarter, five and a half. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, and then yeah, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. the pullback into the uh, this is I eight, think this eight is and a the quarter eight and a quarter inch. deal, I think. I can't. Uh, well, time's no, going by so fast. No, no, they didn't do a constellation deal. No, no, I'm sorry, but that's when the constellation took off, or the constellation deal with uh, a weed happened and caused the other stocks to get a bid. Yeah, they, they, they. Now keep in mind as well that that uh, Aurora also did their own acquisition. They made a, a friendly deal with with ICC Labs, and so there's also some arbitrage against uh, that position as well. Now that, that deal is scheduled to close, I believe, uh, as far as I know, in early November. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that coincides with the New York listing. Yeah, yeah. Well, the valuations are, are uh, now there's a, there's a, a chart. You know, th this company got, high, got up to a new high back in a year ago, back in January. And here we're, we're trying to get there, but not quite. Yeah, but I mean, it's done a lot of work through the whole uh, spring and, and summer. That sure. uh, it's it's you know that that breakout there of uh, the breakout at twelve. If you look at the uh, at the interim high there, sure. the breakout at twelve from back in uh, say March. That that looks like a significant breakout, and that would probably dictate yeah. some some firm support at twelve if if there was a sell off. But um, certainly looks uh, looks stronger. We're, we're gonna, the New we're York gonna, uh, listing is going to be a positive. Yeah, yeah. We're going to switch gears here. Uh, I interviewed uh, uh, Glenn Raymond earlier today with uh, Nutrisci International, ticker NU, and uh, let's let's hear what uh, Glenn has to say about recent developments at Nutrisci. Ticker. Hello, everyone. Here we are again on Midas Letter Raw. Today we have the CEO of uh, Nutrisci International Inc., ticker NU, and uh, I'm introducing Glenn Raymond. Um, and I will say that last Wednesday or Thursday it traded 25 26. million shares, 26 million shares, and that's about a quarter of the shares outstanding. Correct, yeah. So you must have some great things to tell us here, Glenn. And uh, why, why don't you just uh, start by saying, uh, you know, some of the things you got going on here? Like what? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> there's essentially two sides of the business. And here we, we got some product here. Uh, if the p camera picks that up already, so we got some yep. product here. This is an energy pill. Yeah. So that's an energy tablet that we're selling currently in Canada and, and grocery drug chain uh, and convenience stores, right. Safeway, Loblaws, right. 7-Eleven, Max, uh, and it's got some really good traction. Really good traction. We're in, we're in uh, uh, about 5,000, 6,000 stores right now. Right. Uh, There's some pretty interesting people using this right now, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, have, uh, we have Jeannie Bouchard is one of the people that's using it. We've got Nick Kiprios is another person that's using it. There's a right. couple other people that we're going to bring online here. We're going to announce very soon uh, that are using it. Uh, and this is a straight energy product. Straight energy. It's all it does is energy. It gives yeah. you a focus, yeah. alertness, and a boost. And then uh, the other side of it is because of this product, uh, we have the ability to do uh, exact dosaging, um, quick onset in the body, uh, the packaging and whatnot lends itself to convenience factor uh, in the cannabis side, CBD and THC and hemp side of, side of right, the business. Right, right. And, and do you, is your plan to, to go into separate, separate uh, markets? In other words, CBD versus THC versus hemp? Correct. Yeah, yeah, we're working on a number of initiatives that involve all three of those. Uh, on the rec side in the U.S., uh, CBD. There's a there's quite a few number of initiatives that involve CBD. So you've been waiting for this this uh, October 11th, or yeah. sorry, October 17th, 17th launch. Yeah, yeah, and interesting. Uh, okay, it's now it's now coming to fruition. People are starting to look for a finished product, right? They've uh, and they will this product be sold in Canada, or will it be sold in Canada and the U.S.? So on the rec side, we're going to be selling in the U.S. in in California to start, and then it'll migrate over to a couple other states. Uh, on the CBD side, we've got um, um, uh, Southeast Asia that we're working on. We've right. got some stuff in Europe that we're working so on. So an international South e America effort. Yeah. yeah, and Canada as well. Yeah, and and CBD, I guess, is traditionally the uh, the medical yeah the medical benefits side of it. Exactly, focusing on the medical side of it. Uh, which I happen to think is going to be a, a significantly huge market uh, in, yeah. in any of the jurisdictions I mentioned. So, so I guess when you're looking at uh, uh, NU and you look at where it was, say, a month ago, you know, 10, 15 cents a share, 12 cents, when you look at other market caps in the space, mm -hmm. 
people are saying we're extremely this is cheap. It's very cheap. Yeah. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Yeah, very cheap. We're I mean, not as cheap as you were. No, no, yeah, no, no. You should have talked to us two weeks ago. I know, but, uh, I know, I know. Um, yeah, no. I mean, uh, but still, the market cap is still very small by comparison sure to is. what's going on. In yeah, the it's industry. twenty million market cap. Yeah, and yep. and you got potential here for a lot of different uh, products. Yep, a lot of different products. We're going to be on the shelf in the U.S. here very soon, um, very very soon. So by comparison, are you, you hooked up with another company in, 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 in that area that's public, or are you? Yeah, so in, in California, we're going to be, uh, uh, we're partnered with Nutritional High. EAT is their symbol. Uh, E-A-T? E-A-T, yeah. In, uh, is that a Canadian company or? They're based in the U.S. Okay. Yeah, they trade on, on the uh, exchange here. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, Naturally Splendid that we're doing some work with in South Korea and Japan. Right. On the hemp CBD side. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then there's a couple other deals that we're going to be announcing very soon as well. Yeah, so. yeah. And and, and uh, how many? Uh, there's a hundred, about a hundred million shares outstanding. Correct. Yeah. So you're capped at around twenty million bucks. Yeah. Um, now, as far as funding, you just completed a financing we last did. week. Yeah. So you're you're in good shape there. We're in good shape there. We had a number of warrants exercised recently. Right. Um, and then there's another tranche that's coming due very soon. They're yeah. also in the money right now. So. Um, I believe those will get exercised. So we've we're cashed up. We've You're, got lots yeah, of cash and right and uh, <clears throat> the fact that we saw this this humongous volume last week yeah. is there. Uh, can we look forward to some press releases in the next uh, couple weeks, three weeks, whatever? Yeah, you're going to see some news come out very soon, um, very very soon, and uh, yeah, I think people are going to be happy with it. Yeah. Now, do you yeah. think uh, you got uh, some some U.S. buying in in the market, like? We do. We've got uh, we've got a significant interest out of the U.S. I think that's part car, partly contributing to the to the volume. Right. Um, and I think people have just realized that it's finished product time in in the CBD cannabis space type stuff. Yeah. Uh, and the other side of it is market cap. I think those are the, the yeah. three contributing factors. And when you look down the road, say say uh, six nine months a year, what percentage of the company do you think will be tied to the marijuana space, and mm -hmm. how much will be tied to the energy space? I think it'll be fairly, fairly even, fairly even. I mean, we're not, you know, new energy is a great product. Yeah, and, and I, I know a couple guys that swear by it. By yeah, the yeah, way. no, it's a great product. So, I, so it's not like it's going to be abandoned. It's actually the reason that the cannabis space has kind of come to fruition for us is because of this product. So right, we'll, right. It'll, uh, it'll be even for sure, if not uh, weighted more to the new energy side. Yeah. Now, when I re when I met you guys, uh, <clears throat> oh, I guess what a year was it a year ago or I think so, yeah. In yeah. that in that uh, ballpark, yeah. Uh, we were talking about uh, the technology that that made this product very right. very suitable to get yeah. tied into yeah. the marijuana space. Yeah, that is is that technology still? Yeah, yeah. The so at the forefront. In other words, with so much going on. Is, do you have any, do you see any anybody coming out there that's mirroring what you're trying to do? Not really. I mean, when you look at a comparison of what the products are that are coming out in the space, right? Um, you know, we have the ability to be a specific dosage. We can do seven and a half milligrams of CBD or THC, as an example. Right. We have quick onset in the body. We have a sublingual property. It's portable. Uh, it's an edible. Right. Um, you know, when it comes to smoking. You know, there's a number of factors that sure, it does work, sure. but 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 it's not really good for the lungs. Yeah, you know? no, no, I can't. Yeah. Right. So so that so if you go through the features and benefits of our product versus the list of products that are coming out, um, we're, if not better, equally as good as, as what's coming out on the marketplace. And I believe that we're we're stronger in a lot of the areas that some of these other products are. So it's good. It lends itself to uh, yeah. to to a nice product and, and it's effective. Right. It works quickly. well. It, it's certainly effective. If, if I, my memory recall. Yeah. If, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The same type of concept, same type yeah, of yeah. IP and technology and the right. energy product right. is moving forward in, in the CBD and, and uh, THC and, and hemp side of the business. So you guys are pretty excited about where we are right now. We are, yeah, yeah. It's it's our time. Yeah. Right. This is our time. We're finished product. Sure. And so, uh, so key, key dates here would be obviously legalization. Once that's done, yeah. then you you guys are live. You can do yeah. do whatever. Yeah. Then there's there's no more secrets. Right. 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 Um, uh, and then in the U.S., we're we're going full steam ahead as well. So, sure. Sure. So this is uh, yeah. The next next week or so is going to be very interesting for us for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're going to leave it there. Sure. Uh, we would like to have you back probably as soon as possible. Uh, yeah. 
yeah. down the road here and then we'll yeah. continue to watch. Be able to talk about some of the news and, and kind of elaborate more on that for sure. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks you. Thanks. Well, welcome back everyone. Here we are again. We just uh, heard from Glenn Raymond and NutriSci International. Uh, we're going to just talk about some macro things right now with, with Steve uh, Meisner. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about interest rates. And that's something that affects us all. It's, it's everywhere you look. And, uh, you know, for those of us who aren't maybe that familiar with the bond market, we've had a major bull run in bonds. Interest rates are really low and they're starting to creep back up. In fact, I, I've just noticed, Steve, that the, that the long bond in the U.S. is pushing 340. This is like a four-year high in, in yields. It is. And it, you know, no matter what we'd like to believe, interest rates aren't made in Canada. No, no. Anyway, just maybe have, a, have some words about, uh, I'm going to put up a chart here. Well, what's interesting, Ed, and if we go back to the, 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 the long, long-term spike, it's not here. But this the, is the XLB chart, yeah, by the yeah. way. Yeah, but we'll, we'll touch on that. But the, uh, the long-term story in U.S. interest rates is, it was the, the peak in the early 80s when, when uh, Paul Volcker look, jammed up rates. Look at this five-year chart. This is a beauty here. I, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I, I got to point out the fact that we got major well, yeah, we got ma major support there, yep. there, 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 there. Look what we just did. Yeah, for the audience, the uh, chart begins in early. It begins in uh, 2014. So it's about a five, which, four which, or five year which chart. Which will prove five to, year. Which will prove to be uh, about the, uh, you know, heading into the low point in in. So it was in early 2015 was probably the ultimate low in long-term yields and then double pointing again. Double, po yeah, look, in, we got, we in, got uh, lows in yields. Ed's offline there, off he, line. Uh, he uh, his batteries fell out, <laughs> but it's not his, it's not his heart pacemaker, so he's it's, okay. Are <laughs> he's going to be okay. Uh, but but what's important to note is, is that okay. the uh, chart is breaking down now. So. Remember that because it's a bond chart, it means that when yields are going up, bond prices are going down. So this is a price chart on long-term yeah. bonds. It's an ETF in the U.S. So the fact that it's uh, breaking at that uh, twenty-two dollar mark yeah. is bearish from a, a, a technical chart perspective and suggest by many measures and other commentators and analysts suggest that interest rates are going higher and there are a number of fundamental reasons to suggest why that's the case. Yeah, and, and you know, just, just as, you're, as, you're, as this thing goes down, your capital is losing value. Yes, yeah. The, and there you go, I mean, where's, what, this looks, like if I had to give you a chart that says which way rates are going, this tells you rates are going higher. Well, they've already moved now, and that is uh, that will affect uh, that a number dramatic. of sectors. It, it affects, oh. uh, I mean, higher rates in a typical economic model. It, it takes place when when economies are overheating, and there are a lot of measures that suggest that uh, the U.S. economy. We know it's been doing very well. It's running over four point. It was four point two percent GDP growth the, the last quarter. Uh, it's down at 3.8% unemployment, which is at 50-year lows, and that's essentially what's deemed by some economists to be yeah. full employment full because 3.8% exactly. of the workforce is either in transit or they simply don't choose to work. So that's deemed to be full employment, and uh, you've got a hot, hot stock market. You've had a hot real estate market. And uh, you've got a number of things going on that suggest that the U.S. economy is 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 doing very very well, and their their trade uh, deficit is getting straightened out with some of the new trade deals. Sorry to change here, but Tillery just went under went by it under 128. So, Steve, do you think that this is going to put an end? Like, if rates start to go up in earnest, what's that going to do to the Toronto housing uh, speculation? I mean, or are we just in a world where people want to move their money to a, a safe? You could argue it's not so safe in Toronto anymore, but what do you, you know? Cut, well, the housing, yeah, there have been a number of factors driving the U.S. housing market, or the, the Toronto housing market and the Canadian housing market. Low rates has been one, uh, and, and, it, and it's a safe haven. So a lot of, uh, of foreign money has been coming into the Canadian housing market. It obviously focuses on the largest 
urban center, the GTA, and uh, it's, it's long-term stuff. So they may not be very price sensitive to shorter term variables. Of course, it's been a 20 year plus bull market uh, as, as obviously there's been more people coming into Toronto than there is sure. uh, accommodation and that's been driving condo and house prices. Yeah. But the slightest r rate rises in Canada will have an adverse effect on the real estate market because even though we're talking quarter points uh, incrementally, sure. uh, and we don't get back to some of the higher uh, coupons on mortgages of five or six or seven percent that we saw 20 years ago, or the, when the uh, Toronto housing market uh, crashed or fell down in the early 1990s, uh, we had short-term rates in Canada up to 13 percent. Yeah. So to put that in perspective, sure. rates were much higher then. But incrementally, because people are a lot of people are operating on a lot of leverage, a quarter point can be meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. across a big debt spectrum. Yeah, yeah. well, it, I think, I think we, we've never been this indebted, right, as a nation. Like, like mm -hmm. they keep talking about, in, in particular, Ontario and Canada, like the most indebted first world country in the world is Ontario, Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, makes, makes California look like, well, <laughs> why, whatever, you know. You're talking about government levels of debt and, and then lumped in yeah. with consumer and, and, debt. And note another thing, I mean, I wasn't paying attention to the oil price and then late last week I looked, it was 76 bucks, mm -hmm. West Texas Intermediate. We haven't seen 76 bucks in a while. No, that's a big recovery from uh, the collapse. We were we, we peaked out uh, 10 years ago in June of uh, 08. We yeah. peaked out at 147. Yeah. And then we came down to about 27 bucks, which was a huge, huge crack in, uh, in an oil over a couple of years later. Uh, we've had huge production out of the U.S., which kept oil prices relatively low and actually started supplanting. They, were, they became a net exporter of oil in the U.S. a couple of years ago, which right. is quite amazing. Uh, but now it's just simple uh, supply demand and there's still good global uh, trends of consumption of oil and oil's a depleting asset, so yeah. you're always looking for more oil. Yeah, and I noticed there that, that, you know, I listened to uh, some of the n new fake news that some would argue it's all fake. And, and you know, they're, they're, they want to put some pressure on Saudi Arabia to increase production, but I don't know if they can right now, can they? Like. I, that I don't know. I mean, they always keep their cards close to their chest sure. about whether they can turn the taps on or not. Most people believe that they can, but I, I don't really know. Yeah. And, and there's all sorts of, uh, you know, bigger picture theories about uh, what the collapse in oil. I mean, the, the, there's a theory that the Saudis and, you know, leading the rem remnants of OPEC that they, they, they right. turned on the taps a few years ago to crack oil to get Americans to buy SUVs and big cars again. I don't buy into that. Uh, there's another one that the US increased oil production to hurt the Russians because the Russian economy is so tied to oil and they've certainly been hurt by lower oil. Right. I mean, there's a strategic argument to be made there, but I think the Americans just increased oil because new technology with horizontal drilling and yeah. SAG D work allowed them to do it. And they wanted to uh, improve the trade deficit because internally produced oil replaces imports, which hurts the trade deficit. So uh, I, I don't know about the Russian part or the Saudi right, part, right, but these right. are theories attached and they, they, they could hold some water. You, you know, but 75 is a, certainly a big, big departure from what we've it is. seen the last three. Years. And that's just another cost to the yes, consumer, right? It is, and, it, it, and it's inflationary sure it because is. everything that everyone consumes it, or does is linked to oil. Yeah. You know, every time you transport anything, any product or good is shipped by, by truck for the most part, and driving and uh, utility bills and virtually everything, plastics, yeah. everything is linked to oil. Oh yeah. So it was a very good stimulus for the US when oil prices went down because they have a, a much uh, lower tax regime on their retail prices of gasoline and, and diesel yeah. and in and, and, and heating oils. So, I mean, in Toronto, we're paying $1.30 a liter and oil, we were paying $1.30 a liter when oil was at $1.20 or $125 a barrel and we're still paying the same price. That's because taxes got jacked up yeah. while oil prices went down. That doesn't bode well for the future. It means our, we're gonna pay a lot more but for gasoline. And, and touch upon that, we, we talked about this earlier, but oil at 75 US, what are they selling oil for in Canada? Yeah. 
But what I, what I wanted to, I'll come back to that, but what I wanted to say, Ed, was that the, the Americans get what's the effective, very immediate and cross the board agnostic tax cut when oil prices go down, because every single person benefits, not just on a secondary basis of the goods they buy, but think of it when their gasoline prices, when oil went from 100 to 50, and the price at the pumps went down by 40%, that's like putting an extra $50 a week in every yes. American with a car. That's huge. That's an immediate tax cut that doesn't come from the government and doesn't cost the economy. Uh, but in terms of Alberta, I mean, things are very difficult out in Alberta. We've seen that for a long time. Uh, but because the oil and, and, the, and the oil that's produced in Alberta is trapped now due to pipeline shortages, the differential in price point here, and we've now called it up. Okay. Uh, this is a very, very uh, a wow. prominent and, this and is, illustrative. This is unbelievable. And, it, and it's staggeringly bad. The, the, uh, the date on this is September 27th, and uh, the Canadian uh, standard, the Canadian oil uh, uh, reference That's 30 price, U.S. for Canadian oil. Yeah, it's $30 U.S. It's not in Canadian dollars. So, but Western Canada Select, which is known as WCS, as a reference point to uh, WTI, which is West Texas, which is right above there, typically the spread should be about $8. And that reflects a differential in the uh, grade of the oil to the refinery in the ability to refine it. Uh, Light Sweet West Texas is one of the uh, top oils in the world. It's, it's a premium uh, to, to others in some cases, although currently trading lower. We've lost the chart there now. Uh, there we go. But this is unbelievable. This, this is almost a, 40, this is a $42 spread and that's because oil we is don't know where, trapped. To, where it can go. It's shut in. It's trapped in Alberta. Uh, I don't think Canadians understand this, and 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 the, the plight. I mean, Albertans do, but this is because uh, you know Prime Minister Harper tried to push for that pipeline into the U.S., but it was stopped by the Obama administration. That would be well on its way, and now uh, the Trudeau government has stopped uh, and mucked up the uh, file on the Trans Mountain. Uh, you know, so either a pipeline to the U.S., which is a big market and has always been our big market for export oil, or to the West Coast to send more oil out there and twin the Trans Mountain Pipeline to send it to Asia. But we have the oil. We're a resource co country. And, it's uh, disgraceful. It, it really is a disaster, and there's no solution in sight, and it's being mucked up uh, first by the Obama administration and now by the Trudeau administration. Uh, they're not laying out a, 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 good, um, a good solution. And, and the fact that we have to transport uh, oil by, by tanker car uh, is, is, is so uh, egregiously expensive yeah. and, and is constrained in its own right. So this is hurting the uh, Canadian uh, picture in Alberta. And that's got to affect, obviously, the Canadian air currency? It, it affects the Canadian dollar. It's, it's also hurting our Canadian dollar. We're at 77 cents. And uh, it, remember, it was trading at par for five years under the Harper administration. People, you know, yeah. and, and they, they didn't think about it except when they went to Florida and, and saw that uh, they could buy things for the same price. Well, this is why salary costs $4 now instead of $2 because the dollar is down. This is the real danger now is that as interest rates go up because the US economy is running full tilt with 3.9% yeah. yeah. un uh, unemployment and uh, they're running, running uh, you know, hot, hot real estate markets. Um, this is a danger to Canada because if we, we have to follow lockstep and increase yeah. rates here, but our economy is growing at one or 2% not at 4%. Yeah. So we, our economy can't handle the rise in rates like the U.S. needs to slow down. We don't need to slow our economy, but <laughs> it, we don't. I, listen, but, we, but if we raise rates we've created, to, to defend the dollar so it doesn't get lower and inflationary from here, right. then we're going to slow our economy more. But if we don't raise rates, our Canadian dollar is going lower. I know. And and we're already down uh, in you know thirty seven percent. We're gonna we're gonna keep it there, leave it there, and then we're gonna switch gears again. We're gonna talk to or hear an interview that James did 
recently with Menashe Kestenbaum. I hope I got that right. The company is Enthusiast Gaming Holdings, ticker Edward George Larry X-Ray. And uh, we're going to run that right now. Hey, welcome back. My guest in this segment is Menashe Kestenbaum. He's the CEO of Enthusiast Gaming Holdings, trading on the TSX Venture as of today under the symbol EGLX. Menashe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Menashe, can we start with an overview is what is exactly eSports and eGaming? Sure. Um, eSports is, think of real sports or classic sports that everyone knows. Uh, baseball, basketball, football, mm -hmm. um, but instead of having physical activity running around, um, it's all done virtually inside of a video game. What that enables is that you could do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, you know, the sky is the limit mm -hmm. to uh, what's possible, the type of stadiums that could be created, the type of games and gameplay mechanics. Um, and this has been going on for a while now in underground and smaller scenes, but re recently it's reach the mainstream and it's just getting larger and larger support. I think you're gonna see it being something massive in this industry very soon. So this means people are competing in a sort of forum environment on games like Xbox and Wii and these various things? Yeah, um, well, let's take computer for example. Um, so imagine you have been playing a peewee hockey game, right? You've played it at home and then maybe you've taken a little bit more professionally and really put time into it and you got really good and then you start to weed out the people who are kind of uh, B level and you get to the A level players and there the skill is unprecedented and quick thinking strategy. Now take all of that and put it into video games where you have mm. let's say a game that 30 million people are playing. Now out of those 30 million people you're going to have those who are almost Pee Wee level or Bantam League the minor leagues, and then you're gonna have people who are really world-class. Um, and if you have heard of Twitch, where people could watch other people playing, it's actually something people are just fascinated by. There's more people watching gaming than actually playing gaming. Ooh. So people sit and stare at these world-class gamers playing all day, and there's big prize money and leagues cropping up uh, from big companies trying to create this new model, which I think is gonna eclipse uh, traditional gaming. Interesting. So what would you say is the global sort of value of the marketplace? Well, the figure that they give right now is that a billion people in the world are gamers right now. So it's like one um, sixth or seventh. Of one the world. seventh of the world, I think they're saying. So the, the entertainment mm. sector just in North America, last I checked, was something like six hundred billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That's made up of movies, film, television, music, uh, sports. Uh, movies and television used to be the biggest, um, and now gaming has surpassed that in the past 10 years okay. um, and just continues to grow. So what, just to get a sense of what is the most valuable purse for what most valuable sort of gaming environment? So the biggest one right now is the Dota 2 uh, tournament held by Valve called the International. Um, I forget the number, but it's north of 20 million. It, cause it First prize it is 20 million? Yeah, over 20 million. So one guy wins 20 million. One team will one win team. the majority of that. Um, and the second place, uh, you know, right. they will have uh, for second and third place. Okay, um, so yeah. how does that work? How do the economics work for a public company? What, so what is it you actually do? So we actually aren't the ones who own a game. We're not a game developer and we don't own a team. What we own is uh, we have one of the largest gaming networks online where passionate, enthusiast uh, gamers come online to one of our 85 sites and they consume content about the game. So think ESPN. Um, you're not actually playing football on ESPN, but if you're a hardcore fan, you're going to ESPN to catch up on the latest updates, to read the editorials, to speak in the comments, go onto the forums and chat with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So we have about 85 of those sites and each are dedicated to something different. 85 sites, so yeah. each one is sort of game specific? Um, we typically stray away from the games and we go more for platform or a genre. We don't want to be in a space where a game is popular one year and the next year it's gone and we've invested in a site. So right. we may have more like a Nintendo site or three Nintendo sites that are the largest Nintendo community sites out there. And whatever comes onto the Nintendo Switch, um, you know, that's what they talk about and they meet like-minded Nintendo players. Hmm. Same thing on eSports or sports games and PlayStation, Xbox. 
Um, okay, so we so have about 75 million gamers, uh, visitors monthly across the network and growing. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. So how do you monetize that audience? Is it all advertising? So right now the majority of it is advertising. You know, there's about 12 billion ad requests across the network. Um, and most of that is taken from gaming companies who want to get in front of these gamers. Right. Gamers don't want to see things that are completely irrelevant to them. They hate those kind of ads. But if, you're, uh, if you have an ad that's about a game that they actually like, then that's okay with them. Um, mm. So relevant content speaks to them. Sure. There was an incident where uh, there was a shooting at an eSports yeah. event in yep. Florida. Yep. Um, is that kind of the, is, is, it, is it fair to categorize the industry as that kind of representative type of crowd? Is it, is it like gangsters and, <laughs> and kids with guns who take each other too seriously and actually start popping each other off? Is that common or is that just a rare instance that just happened to happen at a gaming event? Well, I think any kind of, like it could be sports fans, it could be anything where you're gonna have some people that are um, unwell, uh, unbalanced. A um, billion gamers, there's got to be a couple in right? there. <laughs> a, a billion gamers are going to have a lot of human beings there. So right. I would say more like if people who come home and watch two hours of Netflix or loves TV, are they more uh, the types who, you know, based on the fact that they watch TV, does that mean they're, they're uh, going to kill someone? I don't, I don't think so. Uh -huh. um, so I think that's, you know, you do have to have security. Like at our, our events, we have uh, a lot of security. Right. Um, just because there's a lot of people there. So it's just something you have to take into okay. account. Okay. So my computer is going to be appearing on, on the screen that the audience sure. is watching. Where do I go to see one of your sites here? Uh, well, let's take um, Destructoid. Destructoid.com. Uh, Oid.com. So that's a site um, that's been around as one of the top 10 gaming journalism sites in the world for about the t past 10 years. Oh, you could actually see an ad on the sides from Namaste. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> on the, so Namaste on the is stock exchange. <laughs> right. So now you can see who one of our advertisers are. Right, well that's, um, that's proof of concept right there, isn't yeah. it? So this is, these are all news articles on different different video games. Yeah. It's all video games. All video games. Huh. Um, you'll see it on the right side, that sidebar, um, you'll see some of the reviews. So mm -hmm. these reviews, a lot of game, um, game companies put it onto the box, you know, in the accolades, uh, Destructoid is, you know, it's like an ESPN. They want to they wanna get the accolades from here. Mm -hmm. um, we bought this site last year. Um, along with Escapist magazine, which is... Um, you bought the site. We bought the two sites. So oh, okay. So initially, they, because it came with a huge audience, relevant huge to Huge audience, core. a lot of revenue, and a phenomenal founder who had built it up from scratch over 10 years and built this fantastic team. He's now our director of content. Um, oh. So with the 85 sites, you know, I started my own blog, and at the time it grew to a sizable audience, NintendoEnthusiast.com, but there was no one really monetizing it well that I could live off of despite the amount of um, uh, eyeballs that it was getting. So at, in 2016, we kind of identified that a lot of these homegrown community grassroots sites with sizable audiences needed some kind of a, a vehicle or aggregator to come in and help them make money so that they could continue building their sites. Okay. So we created in April 2016 this network, which immediately took off and uh, had tons of sites joining it over the, the next few two years. Um, so we went from five sites to 85 sites in two years and the 75 million gamers. But then we started um, identifying opportunities to acquire sites where you would have a founder of a site who had built up a staff. Um, he was making some money, but you know, he, he would love to be part of something bigger. He would like to have a little bit of a nest egg to you know, invest in their future. Um, you know, maybe they had started off when they were 18 in gaming and, and putting a lot of time into this, and now you know, maybe they were 28 and looking to potentially start putting down roots. Mm -hmm. So that's where we would come in, um, offer them something to kind of join our network as an acquired site. Um, we would also, of course, instead of taking a, a cut of the revenue or commission, we would be taking 100% uh, of it. Right. Um, and that's where we've started to amass our own portfolio of sites that we actually own. Um, and hmm. we're, we like to choose uh, strategic ones. You know. Right. So do you generate all of this content internally or is it outsourced? Yeah, we have something like 200 freelance um, and contract um, writers. Oh, so you can actually find that, that number of talented writers yeah. that bring a sufficient 
literary quality to this, or is it more that it's not required to have a high? <laughs> like I'm not right. sounding <laughs> condescending here accidentally. I don't mean to. No, but, you're, no. Well, but think it strikes of the me billion, that it's mostly kids. Think of the billion uh, gamers out there. Right. There must be some who sure. have a knack for writing, and right. those ones, the cream of the crop, rise to the top. Uh -huh. And those are the ones that you know they they rise through the ranks. Whether they're starting off writing as a blogger on our forum communities, we identify them. We start giving them an opportunity on the front page of the sites, and then maybe they work up their way up to a bigger position. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of it's actually created through Destructoid. A lot of the current gaming journalism uh, industry has been created through the sites over the past ten years. Well, that's interesting. Um, so you're actually at the forefront of the birth of a whole new sector. Yeah. Interesting. You know what the number one job that people want to have is? If you, um, they did a, a study recently. It's being a YouTuber. Really? Yeah, that's the number one thing that people want to be. Well, and you have what makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Uh, interesting. So, um, so you're not actually involved in the management of teams and, and capturing that prize pool. Are there companies out there that do that? There are team. There are companies that want to be team management. That you know, they they draft the players, they sign them to contracts, they manage them, and there's all have skills involved there, and then they'll be flying them out to different um, events where they hope to take home a prize pool. Now there's a lot of different eSport games out there, and the prize pool is not as high for all of them. Right. There's some that are more grassroots or fledgling. Um, you need a lot of support, so when you have a publisher who made the game really wanting to support this community, um, and usually it's a loss leader, you know, Riot Games for League of Legends, one of the largest esports games of the past decade uh, had in incredible prize pools, but they weren't making money from that. They were doing that because 75 million people were playing their game, and it built a whole ecosystem where people wanted to buy skins. They bought, you know, the skins are uh, you could kind of dress up a gun or put on a, a uniform that you pay that are exclusive. Your friends all see it and you pay money for that. Oh, so um, that's your new sort of persona. Yeah, that's your new persona. That's your avatar online, you know? Right. This is who you are in real life and yeah. off uh, uh, online. Uh -huh. um, so, th you know, a lot, of the, a lot of that is just to foster the community and get more people playing the game, even mm -hmm. if they're not at that high echelon of right. talents. Interesting. So then, from an investor perspective, if I'm an investor in enthusiast gaming, what am I going to look for in the next 6, 12, 24 months that are representative of value catalysts? In the industry or in the company? In, in your company in specifically. The company? Well, the big thing is that you know, we, I started this little blog. And you know, in, when we started April 2016, um, we had $350,000 in revenue. A year later, we had $3.5 million in 2017. Now we're doing over a million a month. and. Uh, in Comscore, where they verify third-party traffic, um, they're listing us as number five in North American gaming traffic. Hmm. So, you know, the ones above us, like number one is Twitch, which was acquired for a billion dollars by Amazon years ago. They're worth way more now. Um, then you have uh, IGN, GameSpot, Curse, all institutional, and then you have us as the independent, who just recently appeared on there um, and climbing up the the ranks. So I think our goal is to continue growing our, our user base, our 75 million visitors, to a larger number and get you know, up there with the, the top one or two. Um, so user growth is important for us. Revenue growth as we've continued uh, growing extremely aggressively. Um, and then we also happen to have Canada's largest gaming convention, hmm. uh, which was kind of an offshoot for our community of saying, hey, why don't you guys meet offline, in person, and you know, come face to face. Make it real. Yeah, the first time we did that, um, we had 1,700 gamers come to it. A year later, we put it on, we had 12,000 people come. Wow. And this past one we had uh, was 25,000. Wow. Yeah, so our next one is happening end of this month, October 26th to 28th. Hmm. We actually moved from the airport in Toronto to downtown Toronto, and we expect 40,000 people. At the convention center. At the center. convention center. Yeah, you need a big venue so, now. Yeah, wow. it's pretty much a culmination well, incredible. of the whole gaming scene in right. Canada. So at the end of the day, this is a media company. This is a media company with tech being built on top of it to give you one account and ID as mm -hmm. a gamer across the internet, across right. all of our sites. But we're really a community platform. So um, right now, it's, it's mostly media and content. 
but um, as we move on, I think it's going to be uh, a lot more of the tech and events that power help power the community. So I would say it's a a blend of three different industries all together forming one community. Mm -hmm. Okay, Manasha, that's a fascinating <laughs> interview. I've got to say, I'm, I'm newly enlightened in the whole realm of esports. You're going to have to digest that, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> I am going to have to. At least I'm going to learn the language now. Yeah. Um, we're going to leave it there for now. We'll come back to you in a quarter's time, and maybe we'll come down and uh, shoot some segments at your convention if we can. Sure, 100%. And, uh, and we'll follow the story with interest and have you back soon. Thanks for joining me Thanks today. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. Well, what did we learn? We learned a lot. There's lots going on. Geez, I, I can't help but think back to what you're saying here about the price of Canadian uh, oil being that. Yeah, that's that's really quite uh, that's quite an anomaly, and there's no immediate solution there. Cheapest in the world. It is because it's trapped, and uh, in other it's, words, it's they just, can't take it to market. Can't take it to market. Asia wants it. The U.S. will take it, and here we are still importing oil on the east coast of Canada. Isn't that just crazy? You know, it. Yeah, I don't even want to get 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 thinking about it too much because it angers you. It makes you feel like how can they mismanage? Mm -hmm. This is our. This is basically government mismanaging assets. It is. And, it and, is. and pandering to the people that, you know, let's, let's get their vote at any cost and let's just Absolutely. play a stupid game. Yeah. Which ultimately, you know how it ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let, let's go back and talk to, uh, talk about the, the marijuana space because it's such a, you see, Afria is going by the board here up, up a dollar to 17 and a quarter. Yeah. That's, that's near its highs. But I'm going to put, put up uh, James's uh, index here. Sure. And he's there got, it is there. Okay, there you go. And we got we got ten. These are billion dollar. No, this is a small cap. I moved back. Sorry. We got to go back here. I should have done that, but I did. And and uh, I don't know how to do this. I think it's interesting uh, to know that. Uh, we talked about the October 17th, which is only five trading days away, and yeah. what will that yeah. mean when we formalize. Yeah. Um, in some senses, obviously, this most recent rally in early September after the summer break uh, is in, in anticipation of the uh, legalization date, and that's they, they, in the market, they say often buy the sizzle and, and sell the steak. So buy on the excitement, but, but, uh, but maybe you don't need to buy on, on the day of the news. However, in this case, because the cannabis investment space has always had uh, uniqueness in terms of some more right. conservative players and some of the institutions staying on the sidelines, I know some of the banks didn't even play the cannabis space at all and they, they wouldn't allow their wealth managers yeah. and their brokers to play at all. I, I mean, uh, Bank of Montreal and, and, and CIBC became the first players in the space and, and Bank of Montreal sponsored the uh, incredibly successful Tilray deal and yeah. CIBC co-led the, the Canopy deals, the big ones, the, the later ones. So they became more innovative in the space, but other banks uh, were not in in the thing in in, in the participating in, in the sizzle. Right. So uh, the question is, does the legalization now full blown recreational cannabis does that allow for some future buying from some of these more conservative entities like insurers, uh, life insurers who are known to be some of the most conservative institutional investors in Canada, and maybe some of the mutual funds yeah. who have been afraid of the stigma by some of their maybe older clients that uh, aren't, you know, aren't, aren't as uh, open about investing in cannabis. Sure. Does that change the game and is that future buying to come into the space even a week from now, I mean, maybe maybe it is. Maybe it is. You, you, you know, you know, how many public companies are there now in this space? And and uh, there's more coming in. I, I was talking to our, our good friend John McMahon. He's got his, you know, his ear ear to the ground, and he's he knows what's going on. He says there's another hundred companies coming. Yeah, no, I've heard that too. There's a lot coming out. So of the so. Pipe. Is that dilution for the whole thing? There's a lot of supply and, and each, many of them come with different hooks and different angles yeah. now. They're moving way downstream into the retail or they're into the edible space or the different, different uh, unique, uh, maybe proprietary processing techniques and things like that yeah. that's happening. Uh, another uh, point though would be um, perhaps 
Uh, we, we've seen Constellation and their, their two big uh, investments in Canopy. Uh, we hear chatter about maybe uh, beverage companies at some of the other big uh, Canadian cannabis play uh, chatting you know, to each other. Does this legalization, full-blown legalization, does that lead to a new wave of potential uh, uh, marriages or, or uh, takeouts yeah. or friendly deals or, or hostile takeovers? Is that possible from all of these much, much larger entities around the world, the pharma business, the beverage business, the consumer products groups, uh, you know, the, the homeopathic groups. I mean, are they all players who've been waiting and does the October 17th legalization yeah. create that as, as a new, uh, uh, you know, excitement? So, so, so in you're the sitting sector? with your, your company with lots of cash, like to your point about, about potential mergers and, and deals. Are you going to have a sharper pencil today? than you were, say, six months ago. Looking at what's out there, you've got a big uh, war chest. Are you gonna be tougher in terms of what you're looking for, or are you gonna be easier? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the acquisition side uh, is twofold. One is the amount of cash, but remember, a lot of deals are getting done with paper. They're getting done because they wanna preserve the cash. Right, a Little right. cash but we wanna do it with paper because all these companies for the most part are still burning cash. They need cash for their build outs. So most takeovers like the ICC lab deal with, with uh, Aurora. they do that, Aurora. $270 million? Yeah, but it's all, it's all, it's all stock. It's There's all no stock. To my knowledge, it's all stock. So I think there'll be a lot of those, but in terms of sharpening the pencil or not, what, what we're learning from Canopy and, and Afria and, and the others uh, and, and uh, Aurora is the larger cap companies with the greater liquidity are getting international exposure and these US listings like Tilray um, that being bigger is getting a premium. You're getting a premium. So that should make it maybe not sharper pencil uh, to, to do an acquisition. That should make you maybe more willing to do, to do deals because the market is paying up and is rewarding bigger market cap and greater liquidity. It's the liquid names that, not always, but the liquid names that in many cases are benefiting in this marketplace. This is the ten, a list of the 10 biggest, Steve, and uh, if you look at the far, far column, you can see the percentage change increase by, the, it's, it's, uh, this list is rated by that yep. uh, variable. And you got Afria, it, it, they're just about all of them are up uh, six, five, three. You got two at the bottom. Uh, so we had a, a pretty green day. And yes. after today, there's uh, four, three days, three, tr four trading days left before we go live. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and that, this is the, these are the biggest ones, right? So Afria up a dollar, 6%, and uh, Kronos Group at the bottom down 3%. Uh, I'm gonna just take a quick look here. I'm gonna see if we can't find. Uh, we're also, once we cross that path where we get into the legalization of the, of the uh, recreational market, is there will be greater scrutiny by investors of all stripes to look at the companies and say, okay, you've been forecasting these numbers, you've been forecasting these sales figures, these production figures. I think there'll be, over time, more scrutiny on turning these companies from being concepts about we're going to grow marijuana, we're going to get great revenues. There'll be more scrutiny in saying, okay, well, you said you were going to do this. Are you going to achieve that as quarter by quarter goes? Because people will start going from concept stocks to what we call reality. Yeah. And there'll be more focus on the income statement uh, than just on the yeah. concept of having the licenses and the, and the uh, sort of build outs. And that will be an interesting, and that will start separating the yeah, proverbial yeah. wheat from the chaff. Wheat from the chaff. Who, I was who's just delivering? Everyone told us a great story. Who's delivering the goods? Who's delivering the story? And and who's sure. maybe uh, not making the grade, or maybe uh, you know told us a little more than they should have, or promised more and can't deliver right you, now. You know this this is this Tilray here, which is obviously had garnered a lot of attention. We had that blow off. And we tried to rally, it's failed, we filled the gap, we've issued some, a, a, a large amount of debt. And, and here it is, capped at, uh, I still think it's capped around 12, 13 billion with the shares that are out there. And I don't really know if I understand the structure. 
Yeah, well, I... I anyway, we're, we're, we're close. The markets are closing, so... Uh, another day. The market side, I'd say, generally speaking, for the marijuana space, we're, we're on to the plus side. Yeah, Dow was down 56, but uh, but the weed, uh, the, you know, the cannabis stocks and, and, did, and did well overall. The, 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 if rates continue to rise, and we, we've seen it, I mean, and you've lived through I, when, peer, when rates rise, you know what that does? It, Everybody gets crazy after a while. Well, it, it, it draws a lot of capital away from other asset classes and goes into short-term income because uh, you know no one's been holding cash because there's been no payouts on cash. They haven't been holding short-term bonds. So it tends to draw money out both from a safety uh, perspective, yeah. uh, flight to safety, and then also because some of the money stays there because the yields are incrementally higher. So I was just going to put up a chart of, uh, uh, this is the one that's the big one in Quebec. And I'm not having success doing it, so I'm going to have to call on our boys. You know what? I'm going to go back to, go back to, uh, I should have never left that page. <laughs> but I did. Uh, can we have some assistance here from the control room, please? Tech support. Tech support. Yeah, just get that get that that page that hexo. No, it's hexo or get get the, uh, you the want Midas code? letter. The, oh, the, you want the, Midas? Yeah, put up the Midas letter. I can talk about. Okay, and then I want to get the I want to get the small cap list. Okay, go cannabis first. Yeah. And once you click cannabis, you're gonna get here. Small cap. That, that's the one I want. Okay. So here, here's a list of some of the names that we know. Yeah. That have been very. T E R, by the way, is up 12 percent again today. That thing has been on a tear. Um, I don't know much about it. James interviewed him recently, but you see, it's up 12.8 percent, and. Uh, Here we go. I'm going to try and get this up here. Yeah, looks like we got it. There you go. Look at this. Wow. This, this is obviously not all is quiet in the marijuana space. So this deal is it was five bucks a week, week two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It almost hit ten dollars. Yeah. So is there any chart you want to look at here, Steve? You want to talk about anything in specific because. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up soon, and uh, no, I think we'll uh, we can have a review of some other names tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's we'll be do back that. Back on the show tomorrow. Yeah, back on the show. I think James is going to be back on Friday. Okay. Well, we can go through some of the things here and discuss. Um, so uh, that's going to be it, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Midas letter raw ends another night.